What was that you said, Brother Dusk? Demerzel will always be here like she always has been? I see. And what is this about a prison? I don't know about you guys, but I'm all in on whatever is happening here. She will always be here as she always has been. Yes, you've literally just said that. So for the last episode, we were talking about all the different kinds of prisons and the general lack of unfettered agency that was going around. And now we're bringing it back to the singular because according to the digital ghost of Cleon the First, there is a prison beneath the Imperial Palace. It's not the only one in the episode. It turns out Salvor wasn't dead because of course she wasn't. She was just locked away in not only a physical prison, but also a mental one. Gale is also imprisoned. And all of this had already felt like it was leading somewhere. And at the end of the episode, we get there. Or at least to a tease of there. And since this is where my head will be until the next episode, let's start with how we got there. The episode opens with Rue snooping around in Demerzel's room. And because Dusk has had people watching her, he finds out and comes to see what she's up to. The idea that Dominion can restore memories comes out and that that was how she remembered the servants' passages. And while he says knowing about them makes her a suspect in the assassination attempt, she points out how that's absurd. She explains that she's there because Lady Demerzel is a threat to Dominion because of the accident that killed Sarah's family. And he understandably doesn't want to hear that since Demerzel is the closest thing they have to family. She then asks him a fantastic question. Why is the last robot in the galaxy the Emperor's closest advisor? He gets a weird look on his face and says Demerzel will always be here like she always has been. This seems odd to Rue, and when she pushes, he just repeats the same words almost as if it's a recording. It's clear that this area of his brain has been tampered with, and Rue likens it to him being as programmed as Demerzel. He only snaps out of it when he recognizes the design on her toolkit. This leads them to the mural where he spends some time talking about the robot uprising. In his description, humans had been cruel to the robots who just desired to have their full personhood recognized. Rue responds with what I think we can assume is the historical consensus, that when they were denied their rights, the robots turned to murder. Dusk somewhat backs this up by saying that Emperor Benefoss was slaughtered at the hands of a robot, that the first law of robotics was circumvented, and that shouldn't have been possible, but that violation, the first of its kind, ignited the wars. There were robots against robots, and robots against men. Men eventually won, and the robots were eradicated. Except for Demerzel. And Rue bringing that up brings him back to she'll always be here as she always has been. And it's here that you start to put it together that at least some of that big discrepancy in the size of Cleon the first memories compared to the clones is related to Demerzel. While they're talking, Brother Dusk notices that there's a green mark on the neck of a robot character on the mural that doesn't have active chroma on it. It stands out, but he doesn't get a chance to figure out why it's like that because they're needed at Polly and Constance execution. That is happening on the Imperial landing pads on the anniversary of the Starbridge attack. Day has a small crowd of important people in attendance to watch as he cuts off Polly and Brother Constance's heads with a device called the Collar of Typhon. And he is also broadcasting the event across the galaxy so that everyone can see this happen. When he can't choose who to kill first based on the crowd response, he tries to force Queen Sarah to make the call, but she never really does. He eventually puts the collar on Constance's neck and she starts to pray. This sets up an emotional moment that sets up Hober jumping the spirit right into the middle of things and announcing that the beheading has been canceled. Jumping a whisper ship into a crowded area creates a lot of chaos, very similar to a bomb going off. Hober fights his way through the smoke and eventually finds Constant. They see that the guards have grabbed Polly, so they aren't able to save him. Everyone is scrambling, and while Rue goes to dusk, she sees Dawn go to Sarath and hold her. Brother Day is pinned under Demerzel, who is worried because his aura was damaged by the ship's gravitational pulse. 
while this is all fairly fun to watch, especially Becky tossing Brother Day like a ragdoll before his guards swoop in to save him at the last moment, which unfortunately kills her, R.I.P., the aftermath is where things get interesting. Constant and Hover are able to get away and he manages to get the collar off of her neck. The Cleons fall back to the throne room where they wait for their nanobots to kick in. Brother Dusk is all fired up and tells Day the world is watching and that they need to act decisively. Day uses this moment to air his grievances against his predecessor who used to laugh at his interest in Harry Seldon. Instead of going to war, he would rather talk to the Foundation, so he announces he's going to Terminus, an idea that no one supports. This day does not fear change, and according to him, those Whisper ships and that planet belong to Empire. Demerzel and Dusk both try to stop him, and then in a surprising move, Sareth declares that Day has spoken on this matter. She goes to her betrothed and embraces him. He apologizes that this trip will delay their wedding, but of course, she's not worried about that. To stick it in Dusk's face, he tells Brother Don that Trantor is his until he returns, and tells him to keep Sarah safe, which is funny to everyone but him for obvious reasons. In their chambers, Rue warns Sarah that she needs to be careful. The Cleons are fragmenting, but Day isn't the type of person to let things go unpunished, so she needs to master her emotions in relation to Dawn. She even goes as far as saying that once she's married, she could get rid of Day. But even though Sarath values Rue's advice, she reminds her that she's the queen and that she'll be making her own choices. On the way to the jump ship, Brother Day ridicules Polly and picks his brain. Based on the way that he understands the situation, he believes he can disrupt the second crisis by knowing Harry's prediction of war. Selden's claim is that the Foundation will defeat the Empire against all odds, but that prediction presupposes ignorance for the parties involved. Day essentially thinks he figured it out. He thinks he has a backdoor way to prove psychohistory wrong. If he doesn't start the war, then the prediction can't come true. He also gets on Polly for his faith, who is a pretty good sport about it. He tells them that the chief characteristic of the Church of the Galactic Spirit is that it works. Sure, they dress it up, but underneath it is science that they're bringing to these different worlds. He also repeats the quote from the Salvor Hardin in the books and Salvor's father in the show, saying violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. And the way Day brushes this off really underlines his problem. His arrogance blinds him, and if you're not actively singing his praises, he's probably not paying much attention to anything you're saying. On Ignis, things are escalating quickly because, as we'll find out later, Tellum's current body is giving out on her. When Gail confronts her about what happened to Salvor, Tellum explains that she had to detain her when she found out that she killed Harry. What's more, she knows that Gail has been aware of it since it happened. The fact that she could experience his suffering from a distance is impressive, and she kind of wishes that things would have played out differently, but, oh yeah, Gale is also locked away underground, and they're using a form of muzzle to block her specific psychic frequency. You felt him drowning, didn't you? I felt the water filling my own lungs. I felt everything. After Salvor gets wind that the Mentalics are getting Gale ready for something Josiah calls the table, she realizes she has to act. She is in the same situation where they're using dishes to cancel out her mental pitch. So after Josiah leaves, she reveals that she has the flattened out Prime Radiant hidden in her jacket. She remembers what Harry told her about how the Radiant exists in both places at the same time and reassembles it to look inside the vault. Now, the way this works is something I think it's better to not think that hard about, and I'm okay with that considering how entertaining this encounter is. She pops in, and it's like she's right there in front of him, and of course, this is a big surprise for Dr. Selden. What's funny is that, as the person who built the Radiant, he can't understand why he wouldn't know that that was possible. After she delivers the well actually, he starts to work his way through it. He realizes he's not the only copy, and Salvor tries to hold back from giving him too much information. It's fantastic to get to see Jared Harris playing this version of Harry, who is fascinated by the idea that there's a whole other part of the plan he isn't supposed to know about. 
His role is to galvanize the foundation, so why would there need to be another? That leads to the realization that there's a second foundation, and that leads to the reality that the first, the one that he's running, is a control group. Dr. Selden now knows he's been kept in the dark on purpose, a left hand blissfully unaware of what the right hand is doing. His disappointment realizing he's the left hand delivers the funniest moment of the episode. As unsettling as that is on a personal level, he still knows that she shouldn't tell him anything because it could contaminate the math. But because Gail's in trouble, Salvor is willing to take that risk. She has Dr. Selden look into her cell with her, and he's able to figure out how the dishes work the way that they are suppressing her powers right away. When she asks if he can turn them off, he says that he can do better than that. He can adjust the frequency so that she can use them to break out. Before he leaves, Salvor asks about the second crisis, and he says things are up in the air at the moment. Salvor needs an assurance that Terminus will survive, and this isn't something he can give her. He makes a face that doesn't entirely inspire confidence and doesn't say anything. This prompts her to blurt out the name Hober Mallow because, according to Gale, he's going to pierce the Empire's hide. While he's not necessarily happy that she told him that, he eventually reasons that if the left hand doesn't get to put his thumb on the scale, what's the point of having a thumb? Then when he goes back, he scribbles Hober's name on his tablet so that it shows up on the outside of the vault like we saw before, and we realize the timeline on Ignis is slightly behind the one on Trantor, and that this meeting happened before he killed the Warden. Once Salvor busts out of her cell, we get a full understanding of Tellum's master plan. As Gale is tied down to the ceremonial table, Tellum explains that she grew old in that place where she was treated like a god. Having lived a life in isolation, she decided it wasn't fair to die before she had the chance to live. She figured out how to jump her consciousness into the occupied mind of a different young girl, which she took over and this became her second incarnation. Every six or seven decades she would do this again, and each time her powers got stronger. As time went on, she started hearing people from different planets, and eventually heard Gale calling out from her childhood on Synax. It's pretty easy to understand why Tellum thinks Gale is the perfect candidate to become her next incarnation. Her ability to see forward makes her more powerful than anyone else that we've met so far, and this is something that Tellum would integrate alongside her other powers. Gale can't understand why none of her followers are upset by this development, but from Tellum's perspective, and she does seem to have control over them, this is a necessary unpleasantry that will keep them safe in the long run. She explains that Gale's consciousness would still be inside of her body for a while, but then she'll just eventually fade away and become nothing, and from there they start the ritual. When Constant and Hober jump back to Terminus, they see that for a guy who is not trying to start a war, Cleon the 17th has sent a large show of force in the way of Belrios's fleet. They jump right into the middle of that for the most part, but because the spirit has some stealth capabilities, they think they can avoid being discovered if they just run dark. On the surface of the planet, her fathers are left to wonder if she made it out alive. The one from Thespis, who she gets her blue eyes from, and who she refers to as Pater, which I suppose we don't know what his name is because it's like how she said they don't share them, which is what led to the whole Guess My Name game before. That father takes the side of Faith, while Seth Cermak takes the side of scoffing and drinking heavily. He does make his way to the vault to pray, though, and instead of doing that, he decides to get some things off his chest. He curses Harry Selden, saying that Constant was good and that she had more to give than her life. And as he starts to walk away, Dr. Selden appears. He can't really provide any answers about what will happen because of what Brother Day was telling Polly. Psychohistory requires that the masses are ignorant of its predictions. So he mostly listens as Cermak explains how desperate he was to keep Constant out of the church. He never wanted her to be one of Harry's dupes because she had so much potential, and now choosing the church has almost cost her her life. He says what we all think at different times, that Harry values history, but doesn't care about the people living in it. Dr. Selden contests this idea, saying that even though he can't account for individuals or predict their fates, he does see them. After all, their experiences and choices are what psychohistory is based on. And while this is a very effective scene on the character level, it also does a wonderful job of putting that human face on those who are caught in the middle of this massive upheaval. 
Through that, it highlights why psychohistory is such a compelling concept. The required faith only takes you so far by itself, and the plan unfolds over a long period of time. It's about shortening the darkness after a catastrophic event. That event and the darkness is built in, and it's predicted to outlive generations of people. In the face of uncertainty, there's nothing anybody can do but wait and hope that their contributions and sacrifices will produce a better future long after they're dead. It's a noble endeavor without a lot of instant gratification. In light of all of this, we see that on the spirit, Hober thinks that the Lockery wine might be a good way to honor Polly's sacrifice. The spirit is currently undetected but still vulnerable since it can't jump without giving away its location. To Constant, that sounds like the perfect situation to advance her plan for betting Hover, and she makes it happen. The build-up to this has been a lot of fun to watch, so there's real satisfaction in the cuteness of it all as it's going down. That continues in the afterglow, where Constant points out that their first date was his near execution by the Titan's prick, and their second was at her beheading. But the cuteness can't last because Bel Rios does hail them before Hober can crack the wine. And it does seem like they're betrayed by the mark that the spacers put on his wrist. What's really exciting about how this episode is put together is how the different stories on Trantor start to converge while the characters are all in different places. Brother Dusk and Rue return to the mural where he applies some new chroma to the green stripe in an attempt to reactivate it. It works and the mural starts to swirl before revealing a door. Inside there is a crazy stairway that apparently no one has ever seen before. Dawn reaches out for Sarath and they go back to the heat sinks where he tells her that he's been thinking about her proposal. He's on board with becoming the father of her child because it would be the one thing that they couldn't take from them. He uses the device to reverse his sterilization and we have our second baby making situation of the episode which at this point absolutely feels like a way of producing characters for future seasons. I expect that both of these encounters will lead to offspring. Their afterglow is a lot more serious because now that things are in motion, Don doesn't think he'd be alright with letting Day raise his child. It's a classic case of a thing that makes so much sense when you're caught up in the moment, that everyone involved is too distracted to think things through. When they do that together, they realize that there isn't much they can do about any of it. Even if they could think of a way to get rid of Day for good, there's no way to get around Demerzel to do that. There is a great intercut scene with Brother Day telling Demerzel that his trip to Terminus is his destiny, while Rue questions Dusk about what they've discovered, and Dawn starts putting things together. He says he always thought the clones were autonomous, a pure extension of Cleon I, and for that reason Demerzel served them. But in truth, Demerzel may only serve the original. In that hidden chamber that Demerzel took great pains to conceal at the bottom of the stairs, Dusk and Rue are greeted by a digital representation of the man himself. Cleon says, You wanted answers about Demerzel's origins. This chamber has been considered many things, but at first it was a prison. And he welcomes Cleon the 16th by name. Then it cuts to Demerzel who's watching Day get ready for the jump to Terminus. He says that he's always wondered what she saw when the rest of them were sleeping. All that they must be missing and the thoughts that must haunt her. Dusk approaches Cleon the first and asks the question, a prison for whom, while Sarath and Dawn continue to fill in the blanks. The three clones don't wield the real power. Demerzel is Cleon's only true heir, his forever empress, and after the camera pushes into a close-up of her eyes, it cuts to black. Can we say that everyone's thread pulling is the common thread of this episode? I just did, so I guess that would be a yes. But seriously though, things are coming together and the show feels like it's making confident strides towards this season's ending. This episode literally has a bit of everything in the best possible way. There are payoffs, intrigue, and a promise to answer big picture questions that feel like they exist on a separate plane. I suppose if you were holding out hope that the show would loop back around and deliver some of the familiar reveals that surrounded these characters in the book, then you might find yourself disappointed. Where Hober and Bell are right now makes that seem less likely than it had. 
I don't really see how they could have the same kinds of endings that those characters had in the books. But I don't know. Everything makes sense. And the show feels like it's on the verge of crafting something new and exciting based on all the changes it's made. We might not get that, wow, look at that, Hober is just like me, he used his brain to outsmart everyone moment. But if we can set that attachment aside, we might get something equally as satisfying. I suppose by this point, it's not a huge surprise that the Cleons are most likely puppets. But what is exciting is that I have no clue what the next episode is going to reveal about how that came to be. I definitely have ideas based on reading the books, but the end of this episode leaves me questioning if things will line up anywhere as neatly as I had imagined. The reveal of the missing memories works as a good example of how everything is up in the air. We got the answer to the mystery that Dusk and Dawn uncovered at the memoriam. But who was actually behind the memory curation and for what reason? Obviously, Demerzel keeps it going, but did Cleon remove things from their memories about her because he did things he doesn't want them to know? Or is it just a way to keep them in the dark about who's really in charge? The end of the episode has a dark feel to it, a dark feel surrounding Demerzel, but who is ultimately responsible for that darkness? My ears absolutely perked up when they started talking about the robot uprising, the robot wars. Anyone familiar with Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics has been wondering why they don't seem to apply to Demerzel. I personally never thought this show completely abandoned the concept, but I was curious as to how they might expand on things and explain how Demerzel was able to do some of the things that she does. She started to get into this when she was talking to Sarath in the previous episode, so when Dusk mentioned the three laws were circumvented and that shouldn't have been possible, it started to feel like we're on the verge of getting some real answers. One last thing. I take Demerzel at her word that she serves Empire. And I did see some discussion about what that meant after the last episode. I think based on Dawn's observations, you could interpret this ending to mean that Demerzel is Empire herself. But it doesn't feel exactly right anymore. This is by far the most anticipation and excitement I've carried between episodes of this show. And I can't wait to find out what's going on with that prison. Does what Hober pulled off here count as piercing Empire's hide? He did what Rue warned Sarath to never do. He embarrassed the man in front of the world, and I was kind of impressed with how quickly Day moved past that. While this version of Day had previously appeared as a much more broed out version than what we're used to, his moves in this episode might be revealing some complexity. In the last episode, I was wondering why he was confident in the throne room whenever he was confronted by Harry's consciousness. I mean, beyond the fact that he was ending the dynasty. Now you can see that that's a part of a bigger plan that he has. He really does believe he's got everything figured out, which I like. Now it's like that on top of the Galactic Empire falling, we have a main character stepping up to position his own dramatic fall right in the middle of things, and we know what happens when things go wrong for the Cleons. There is a lot of collateral damage. I was not expecting Tellum to hijack Gale's body. I suppose that will work though, and it does introduce the resolution I was hoping to see on Ignis. In Gale's sensitivity to Harry's death, did she actually feel that when that happened? And Tellum's ability to literally jump bodies, those both introduced some things that could be built on later. And how does the encounter between Salvor and Dr. Selden manage to be equal parts unexpected and gratifying? They made the whole Hober Mallow's name showing up on the vault situation make sense, and they provided some additional depth to vault Harry. I also like how they spent some time examining the psychohistory of it all and thought that Saramac was a good choice for the character to do that through. You know, in the back of his mind, he's still got a gripe about Harry just complimenting his suit the last time they crossed paths. So, fantastic episode. A prison for who? Will Terminus survive? Will Brother Day outsmart Harry Selden? And on the top of the list, what is really going on with Demerzel? And I think that's a great place to leave things. I can't wait for the next episode. And I will be talking to showrunner David S. Goyer about that one. So make sure you look out for our conversation, which will be out after my episode nine breakdown. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.